uh, several schools of communication uh, that developed in, more or less in parallel in the last 60 years. I talked about the Chicago School, implicitly the Columbia School. I talked about the Canadian School, McLuhan and Innes. I talked about the contextual school, it's not really a school, it's just a few people, uh, which I have to the um, But each of them was interested in a different definition of effect. And one of the differences among these schools is whether their focus was on the individual or on the society as a whole. For example, the Franklin School was interested in the class system, whereas the Columbia School was interested in individuals. I'm talking to people who are here this morning. And another difference among these schools is whether their interest was in effects that have a short run, like changing opinions, attitudes, and actions, which I would call socio-psychological, and the effects which have a long run. So, as I got older, I became more interested in the long run than in the short run. In other words, just to give an example, I would not be interested in whether the automobile uh, changed the nature of my uh, the day, okay, to talk to young people. But I might be interested in the way the automobile has changed the social organization of society, whether we live near the center, dispersion, all kinds of things. And so I am arguing, as I did this morning, that it's time to begin to think about television as a medium that has not only short-run effects, whether the Coca-Cola advertising uh, makes you drink more or less Coca-Cola, but some bigger questions about the long-run effects of the media on society. So that, for example, we have precedents that are very interesting in the area of print. Some of you will know the name Elizabeth Eisenstein, the historian, who argues that the printing press had a major effect on the Protestant Reformation in the sense that up to the print, up to the era of print or multiple, uh, of mass production of print, we were or, uh, dependent on intermediaries in the Catholic Church, for example, or in any Christian church, intermediaries between us and God. There was the priest, and we were dependent on him and on the church to make a connection to God. With print, everybody got a personal copy. God produced a cap and a t-shirt to say, you can't call me directly. It's a local call. It's not international. It's a way that I will give everybody a printed Bible, and it's you and me. And that has big consequences for the history of Western civilization. And here we're talking about a medium of print. And so one of the big questions that interests me is what will be the long-run effects of broadcasting. And I mentioned this morning that one effect is immediately obvious that broadcasting moved people, broadcasting moved politics inside the home. It wasn't inside, it was in the village square, it was in the political club, it was in the cafe where we debated politics and, and where the newspaper reached us. And now it's all or was for a while at home. It's changing again. But I'm giving you an example of one kind
with of the of two institutions that have been directly affected by broadcasting, namely the family and politics, the way in which print affected uh, the social system and the religious system and so on. I'm suggesting that broadcasting affects more than any other institution, the institution of family and politics. This is not the subject of my lecture. Uh, except that I wanted to introduce the idea of a difference between short-run effects and long-run effects. So now I will tell you autobiographically that my interest in mass communication began with short-run effects, with Lassus Hill's tradition at Columbia University of studying how people make up their minds in the short run and what to, to, how to vote, what to wear, what movie to see, what uh, attitude to change, and so on. How they were influenced by media that contribute to the making of decisions. That was Lazarsfeld's main concern for the years in which I grew up at Columbia University. And then, Something, and a lot of things, changed me since then. But one of the things that changed me, and in fact changed my whole uh, outlook on mass communication, was having been asked in Israel to introduce, or to head the team that introduced television into that country. So I was head of television, believe it or not, for two years, more or less on loan from the Hebrew University. And then something happened to my own outlook on media research. Namely, I moved from short run to long run and from the individual uh, focus of short run research to a much more societal focus of long run research, which really connected me with the original concern of American sociology with the media, namely not how Coca-Cola sells uh, its product, but how the media integrate or disintegrate societies. And this is, makes a big connection between myself, I think, and the Department of Communication at the University of Bucharest. So, this, uh, with this as a background, I want to talk about a series of studies that I have done together with my colleague, uh, Daniel Dayan, in Israel and everywhere else, uh, in, the United, in Israel, in the United States, and in Europe, basically, in the Western world. And this is a story entitled, Media Events. So I'm showing how I move uh, from individualistic and short-run effects to becoming interested as director of television, for one thing, in the genres of television and in the kinds of content that contributed to the integration of social systems, of nations, or the world, the Olympics, for example, or the World Cup, and so on. So how did this begin? It began with the coming of Anwar Sadat, president of Egypt, if you remember that, in about in the 1970s. What? You were not born. I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> history. Uh, the president of Egypt, whose name was Sadat, decided that this was enough no more war. He got up from a dream, let's say, in the middle of the night, and said, I will fly to Tel Aviv, to the airport, and tell them it's enough. We have to make peace. Uh, and so he got out to it. He woke up from the dream, and he told Walter Cronkite that he was going to do this. He got on an airplane. He was greeted as if it was the closest ally that had existed 